Well, folks, I've been telling you over and over again on this channel that we are living in some strange times. I think the devil knows that his time is short, and he's kind of <laughs> just releasing the hounds on everybody in the world. And what I mean by that is that the devil is working overtime for his preachers and ministers to be going full-time giving false gospels, false doctrines across the world. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And uh, I've got a pastor friend of mine on the phone with me, and his name is Pastor Austin Vestron, and he is the pastor of the Lighthouse Baptist Church in Bolivia, North Carolina. And he's going to tell us an interesting story of something that happened to him recently, and uh, we're glad to have him on here. Pastor Austin, how you doing today? Doing great, my brother. Doing great. Got, glad to be on with you and glad to be able to share this uh, encounter that I had, that's for sure. Amen. Me too. Well, you told it to me, and I was just uh, just disappointed but not surprised. So you take it away. Tell us what happened, and just tell us a little bit about yourself real quick, and then uh, uh, let everybody know you're out there in Stephen Furtick territory, of course. And then <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll, uh, you just tell us the whole story, man. <laughs> yeah, well, bro, like you said, my name uh, Austin Best from the pastor of Lighthouse Baptist Church in Bolivia, North Carolina. I was saved when I was 17 years old at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Interesting enough, I uh, came under deep Holy Spirit conviction uh, that day as a 17-year-old young man, you know, called upon the Lord to uh, save me by grace through faith, you know, not of works lest any man should boast, and totally changed my life. As 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that God will do, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. And I had that change in my life, and, and God has just done miraculous things since, and I thank God for and give him all the, all the glory for everything that he's done uh, in my life, brother, I sure do. Amen. But on the case of the person that I ran into the other day, so uh, with this encounter, I was actually at work because uh, I'm a bi bivocational pastor. So I was at work and about to load some stuff up to take to a location to drop off some electrical things. And a truck driver pulled up, and she got out. And, of course, I was in the United States Army for a little bit. had a third ID hat, so that caught her attention. So we started talking there. She was a little bit older than me, of course. So uh, back in the 90s, she was in the military. But anyways, started talking a little bit. Uh, she uh, walked away to inside the warehouse. I had to go do something else for a minute. She come back out and started talking a minute. Pulled out a gospel track and um, handed it to her uh, to give her the gospel. I know she's a truck driver, wouldn't necessarily be able to come to our church, but, you know, to get the gospel. I didn't know if she was saved, of course, and, and um, wanted to try to give that to her. And she started um, getting really emotional. She told me that she uh, felt like this was meant for me and her to talk and that um, she had just gotten um, out of church the day before. I guess she hadn't been in a while or, or she was just really emotional. And I was like, I was like, yeah, that's great. I mean, God, of course, set it up, you know. And she started talking about, well, my pastor died in Columbus, Georgia. And, you know, I'd been in Columbus in, at Fort Benning. And she started talking about that. And I said, well, what's his name? And she looked at me and said, well, she was a she. And she told me the person's name that passed away. So I said, okay. I said, you know, just okay. And then, and I wasn't getting into that yet yet but anyways we go on the conversation doesn't get too long I'm so, uh, so she was like well my pastor yesterday uh talked on this wonderful sermon she didn't give the name of it but then she gave the name of the church and pastor and she said well have you ever heard of steve furtick i was like yes i sure have at elevation worship which all of you know of course that is in charlotte which is a few hours away from me but anyway still in here in the state of north carolina and she um, immediately, immediately didn't take long before she started um, getting into the doctrine of tongues, as you know, the charismatics would teach. And um, some other things that she started talking about, what really struck me was this, is when she started getting really um, uptight about preachers because she saw us from a Baptist church. So, you know, mm. Baptist, we Baptists are known for being confrontational, mm. uh, of course, and for um, holiness and separation and mm. yeah, things sure. of that sort. So she Legalism. Legalism. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there, yeah. There you go. Capital L. Capital L. So she immediately yeah. got on the on this thing of, um, well, I believe that, you know, we as people that are Christians, you know, we're sa saved by grace through faith. And she said, it's not of works. It's not of works. It's not of works. Just kept saying that. She So she said, 
we all have problem with sin. And she immediately told me, she said, I'm a gay Christian. And this is where I just totally was like, do what? And I had to, and that's it, at the point I had to really start talking to her in depth of the, through the scripture, even though I, I, I didn't have a ton of time, I was able to uh, speak with her for a minute. So what we talked about was this, and I'll try to give a long story short, then I'll let you ask questions, brother, to make it more specific. But um Start talking about Romans chapter one, of course, you know, um, and, and those scriptures there on the homosexuality and what God thinks about that, um, where men need, leave the natural use of a woman, and, and so on and so forth. And, um, and and she said, "Well, I know what I'm doing is wrong, and and I know this and I know that." But then she went back and started getting on the tongues thing, and she said, "Well, you don't believe in tongue speaking?" I said, "Not in the way that you do." And I got into Acts chapter two, and of course, of course, we got First Corinthians fourteen. And she didn't like some of the things I was saying, and maybe we can get into that. Um, but she got more defensive over me attacking her doctrine of tongues and her being a gay Christian. You know, I explained to her that God changes us when he saves us. Mm -hmm. and, and she just kept going back to the fact, well, we all struggle with sin, and we all yeah. struggle with different things. And, and, you know, no separation, no holiness. And her biggest problem was this, and I told her, I said, I said ma'am, the biggest problem that, that I see right here is, uh, your interpretation of the Bible. I see what a lot of people do is they their hermeneutics are, are terrible. They, you know, I said that's the science of the study of the Bible. You know how you should interpret uh, properly, interpret and literally interpret the Bible to make practical application. And her mind just looked blown. She had never heard that before. And what really bothered me was when she said this. She said, "Well, that sounds good and all, and that and and that's great and everything." And she said, "That's fine," but she said, "I know how I felt." When, oh. What, happened to me happened to me see it was all based on her experience and it just seems to me brother and we'll talk about a little bit that his fruit specifically Stephen Furtick and I'm not just talking I know each every church could have a crazy member or you know something but it seems to me that his fruit is not it is Matthew chapter 7 fruit it is not fruit that abides and fruit that remains it's uh tossed to the wind and, and tossed to and fro and not settled in the scriptures and their their main emphasis in in, in authority and final authority is not the scripture but it's uh experience and feeling so mm. that's in a nutshell that's what happened to me okay so she basically was just saying that she doesn't care what the bible says she knows what she felt yes that's that's exactly what happened and you know she didn't really want to get into the literal interpretation of acts chapter 2 or first corinthians 14 or romans chapter 1 or Second Corinthians, or any portion of the gospel, because brother, I talked to her about Holy Ghost conviction. It looked like she had never heard of Holy Ghost conviction. John six forty four, John mm -hmm. chapter sixteen, verse seven through eleven. You know the Holy Spirit's work in the world today. He approved the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. She had never heard those things, and she had never had that affected mm -hmm. her life. So salvation to me eluded her in the sense that she didn't understand what it truly was from the scriptures, and she didn't care to know it was what she had felt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. So it's just a feelings-based religion, and according to our documentaries on Third Adam, that seems to be like what mystery religion is at its very core, is feelings-based or experience-based rather than Bible-based. Correct, correct, and that's what she was going off of, and it bothered me when um, she was more con she was she wasn't concerned about her holiness before God. You know, the gay thing didn't bother her. When I got onto that about her, she said, "I know I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong." Mm -hmm. But the 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 way she felt when she got to speaking in her quote unquote tongue is what she defensed and was defensive about to me the most, which bothered me. Which mm -hmm. is goes back to what 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 we, you've talked about in your documentaries and and the different things we've seen is the experience, what I feel and what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, in your opinion, you know, you've dealt with folks, you've been around, and, um, you know, what is it that people are so defensive about their experiences, especially tongues? Like, like you know, I mean, you can do anything you want. You can burn an American flag. You can do any controversial, obscene thing to them. Well, I mean, whatever. They, they're they okay with it. But when you talk about their tongues, they, they go into orbit. What's the deal with that? Brother, to me, it seems like this, and, and this may be one aspect of it, but it's one that kind of sticks out to me. A lot of people get on to us as independent Baptists for tradition, but to be very honest with you, brother, I think it hurts their traditions and what they've been taught is why they get so defensive about their the tongues and the different things, the experience they have, because they know what I felt. I know what happened has happened in my family. I know what my tradition has been, and this is the way we'll continue mm. to do it. I hear so many people get on to us 
You know, it's something even simple. It's wearing a suit and a tie. And, you know, they'll say, well, that's your tradition. That's your tradition. And, you know, well, their tradition is speaking in quote-unquote unknown tongues. And if you get on their pet doctrine, so to speak, you know, they'll go berserk. They'll go berserk. So I think a lot of it has to do with flipping the script back on them with tradition. And also I think some of it has to do with pride in the sense that if somebody knows something they felt in their life, they don't like to be told otherwise. And they don't like to be corrected on those issues where it would be wrong according to the Word of God. So I think a lot of it has to do with pride as well. Yeah, sure, sure. <clears throat> well, I've met a lot of people who have suggested that all of this uh, experience-based stuff, especially like, you know, your your way out there Pentecostal charismatic stuff, that that's all rooted in pride anyway. Who's the most spiritual? And I guess even the even the Baptist world can do that too, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's true. That's <clears throat> true. No one's immune from it. No, Absolutely. yeah, it, it, you know, it, uh, pride is a disease from which there is. Uh, oh man, everybody gets it. And, uh, but, and that's why we try to tell folks, you know, you need to check your, your beliefs and teachings, what you believe according to the word of God. And, and if, and there's been a couple of things through the years, brother Austin and, and God helped me, uh, with good teachers early on. The Lord put some good men in my life and I was able to learn some sound doctrine early on, but I had a few ideas about God early on that were wrong. And I just had right. to just abandon them because the Bible said otherwise, and, right, um, absolutely. So, I'm with you on that. But it seems like most people are not willing to do that. Is that the case for you? Uh, yes, from the case that, especially with this uh, uh, female that I ran into, she she had no care for what I was giving her from Scripture because I was loading her down with verse after verse, Scripture after Scripture, and she just she wasn't willing to lay down what she had experienced for that Bible. Mm. And I told her, and, and I tell other people, she isn't the first one I've run into like this, is, that that Bible is the final authority. I call it the authority. I mean, it's my it's the authority I go to. It's the final authority. I mean, it is exactly what Paul said in Romans chapter three, verse three and four. You know, shall unbelief make unbelief make the faith of God without effect? He said, God forbid. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Sure. And, and a lot of people sure. have a problem with that. They, I, I find that when the rubber meets the road, they have a problem with that. Sure, sure. Well, let me read you a verse, and maybe this is uh, something that I see. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it talks about you know false teachers in verse 5, having a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. Uh, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women. And I think it's funny how they go after the women laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And he, verse number eight is what I want to focus in on, just to uh, see what you think. Now, as Janice and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds uh, reprobate concerning the faith. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that as far as can can a, can God just darken somebody's mind because they've so willingly turned from the truth? Or am I misunderstanding that verse? Well, what are your thoughts on that? No, brother, I absolutely agree with you. And, you know, that takes me to Romans chapter 1 as well. You know, he said, he, he said God gave them over to a reprobate mind. You know, they had rejected the light so much. So God mm. just finally said, you know what, he gave them up to their vile affections. The scripture actually uses that term. And he says, gave them over to a reprobate mind to do this, those things which are not convenient. I believe God will do that physically with sin, morally, but I believe that he'll do that doctrinally as well, brother. So I'm with you on that, especially right here in verse 8, reprobate concerning the faith. I believe, you know, that's a, that's the spiritual aspect to it. And, I, and it, it's amazing. I, I think about this verse, and I think about this, this woman. Her mind has been, seems, seems to me, so corrupted because— Somewhere in her life, she has rejected absolute truth that God may have just finally given her over to that mind and the religion, the spirituality that she wants. Mm. Absolutely, I'm with you. Well, now, and you I believe that happens a lot. Sure, sure, I, I do too. I think I think it happens to church people. And, uh, absolutely. you know, and that's something that I, I see a lot of. Um, now, you just use the phrase absolute truth. And um, that seems to be the debate of the day. I, I saw a uh, there was a evolution debate, and one guy stood up and he says, "All right, do you believe that there's no such thing as absolute truth?" And the college professor up on the stage said, "Yes, so that's what I believe." And the guy said, "Are you absolutely sure?" And the college professor said, "Yes, I am." And he walked away and said, "No other questions, please." You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah. absolute <laughs> truth, absolute truth. 
Uh, I think we'd live in a day and age now where everybody, nobody really knows what that is. And I don't even know if anybody's really interested in what absolute truth is. And it seems like Christianity has bought into this subjective mindset of like God's like God's like Burger King. Just have them your way. You can order any custom flavor of it that you want. And it's all the same. It's all good. Um, but I don't know if that's necessarily true. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, my thoughts on that are this, you know, you mentioned the word subjective, you know, we got subjective truth. We got objective truth. Subjective truth, of course, comes within from within us. And of course, objective is from without of us. I mean, if we, if we went off of subjective, you know, what I thought was right, if I went up to you and shot you in the head with a gun, and I thought that was right. Then nobody should penalize me for that. But thank God there is an objective truth. I mean, you could go back to the most basic objective truth in the word of God, you know, the, the, the 10 commandments, the law of Moses, which, was what our country was founded off of. I mean, he says, thou shalt not kill. Imagine if that's objective, that's set in stone, that's something with outside the realm of, uh, of any, that any one person could, you know, come up with. Cause my opinion and someone else's opinion could be different on that. So when it comes to objective truth, that's something that's got to be absolute from with outside of us as human beings. It's got to be because we all as human beings have different mindsets. We have different ideas. We have different opinions on things. So, uh, when people try to deny absolute truth, like you said, and uh, I believe it goes back to the root of not people not, not wanting to, to understand the difference between subjective and objective, that there is truth from what's outside of us. If we just went off of, you know, what I thought was right, you know, we'd all be doing, there'd be total anarchy and total chaos and, of course, and total confusion. And, and so people have to come to the realization, unless they lie to themselves, which a lot of people do, that. There is something without of us that has determined what truth is. And, of course, we as Bible-believing Christians believe that absolutely our God has mm-hmm. in his perfect word. Yes, yes. And we believe that the Bible is absolute truth and yes. that uh, it's the, the Bible has never been proven to be scientifically or historically inaccurate. And although many people would bend over backwards to try to prove that, and uh, but uh, this poor woman, Lord have mercy, she was, she just was so messed up, and and but she defended, but she, she was into all kinds of immoral things, but she was dead set on that tongues and that experience and that I don't know what what, what is the what is the point of that? Like is that like some sort of high they get from some religious euphoria or what? What do you think was going on in her mind? I think that's exactly what it is. I think she had gotten her emotions and her her. Her, her flesh so um, hmm. so headed, you know, it, it felt so good. And uh, it, man, I'm telling you, Second um, Timothy chapter four for that. I mean, tr- verse three for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, after their own lust, shall they eat to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know, I think it was her own lust that has driven her to this feel good religion, if you will, her own uh, desire to have her flesh pleased and her ears tickled if you would i I believe that's exactly what is euphoria um um and just the way that it makes them feel and and to go back to second timothy chapter three verse eight you know that word reprobate is interesting it it just it it means unapproved it means rejected cast away i mean and, and and it's just that explains perfectly these people spiritually and doctrinally hmm wow wow well, you know, I I think the first mention of the word reprobate in the Bible is uh, in the book of Jeremiah. Reprobate silver shall they be called, for the Lord hath rejected them. And uh, if that if the law first mention is. is if the law first mention is right, let me just pull that up on the screen while I got it here. Um, I'll get my Eastward program pulled up. Yeah, Jeremiah six thirty says, "Reprobate silver shall let's see here, uh, reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them." And so if that definition is consistent throughout the Bible, and usually with the law first mentioned, that's what that means. It means that even God has rejected these people. And, and the thought that God would reject somebody, that doesn't seem to line up with Stephen Furtick theology. And, and brother, I agree with you. And, man, how we could talk about that for a long time. And, and, people, and people don't understand that God rejects them because they first reject him. I mean, you see that with Pharaoh. You see that in Second Thessalonians chapter two, when um, God's going to send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who received not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, they are the ones that did not receive the truth. So you know what God does? He rejects them. And, and I agree with you. The, the fertile theology is so far from 
what scripture says about that in, in, in according to with rejection. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, let me tell everybody a story real quick. I, uh, just, just a couple, I don't know how long ago it was. It wasn't too long ago. I, uh, preached for brother, brother Austin at his church and he picked me up from the hotel and he was playing elevation worship in his car, uh, as a joke to me, <laughs> <You know? laughs> he was yeah. pulling a prank on me. I thought, what kind of, what kind of guy, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, we were having a good yeah. laugh about that. Uh, yeah. But uh, tell us, you know, you're not you're not too terribly far. You're kind of down there in this country. You're not like next door to the guy, but you're kind of in the area. Uh, what kind of influence does that ministry have down there on churches? And what what's the fruit of all that that you see down there? Well, to be honest with you, especially this last year, I have seen Elevation Worship's ministry. Oh, man, I don't want to use the term blossom because that sounds like something good. I, um, it has really took off mm. um, in my area. You know, you'll see it on the back of people's cars, you know, the elevation worship with the Chevron and, and the different things, you know, the little bumper sticker you're seeing. And, and, you know, the contemporary churches in my area are more and more and more seeming like they're going to that area. I always hear people mention, well, elevation worship has good music or, or, or things of that nature. And, of course, I'm starting to run into people around here that uh i.e you know the the truck driver um and, and others who are very very fond of stephen Furtick, not knowing the kind of fruit he produces you know matthew chapter 7 verse 15 it says beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves you shall know them by their fruit mm. and when i met that woman brother i that was the first thing that come to me is like this was the fruit of his ministry and not just because of her i'm not just taking one one case uh, I've listened to this man preach. I have. I've listened to his messages. You have. You listened to him, of course, for five hours. I'm sure. Mm, yeah. <laughs> About that. But um, you, their their fruit is what bothers me. Um, because. I tried talking to her about this, and I'll mention this real quick about a text without a context is a pretext. And I mentioned that to her, and that's something you know we know and we hear. But to her, it was totally foreign. And and Stephen Furtick is a master doing that. He 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 doesn't preach rightly divided or in its context. And the fruit that he gets is people like her, mm. um, sadly. So, and I'm seeing it a lot down here, though. Yes, I am. Well, you know, it seemed like somebody would argue, say, "Well, now isn't that the type of people that Jesus came for?" And of course, like no question, uh, Jesus came for the most down and out, most depraved thing. And uh, for but for the grace of God, so go you and so go I. And That's right. uh, but the thing is that Jesus, when he when he touches a life, he doesn't let them go off and continue in the sin that they were in. You know, absolutely. And so if a drunk gets saved, he he's you're not going to find him under a bridge still drunk. You know, the Lord's done something. There's a work that's been done in this man's life. God has changed his heart. And so the problem is that these people today, they are continuing in their sin, saying that they're under grace and to calling themselves disciples of Christ while living in blatant, willful sin. And uh, I, I even look here in... Uh, let's see here. Shall you know Romans? I believe it's Romans six. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Let's see here. The uh, the phrase yeah, God yeah. forbid. Let me just pull that up in the in the book of Romans here. Uh, yeah, Romans six fifteen. What then shall we can shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Meaning that the grace of God teaches you to get at all that stuff. And so there's even a uh, there's even a phrase in Titus. Uh, let's see here. The grace of God teaches. Let's let's go there. It's teacheth, e t h, and uh, that is in the which means a continual teaching. And uh, what is it? That's in Titus two. And uh, worldly. Let's see here. The word lust is in the New Testament. I want to look that up there. It's in the book of Titus two. Yeah, there it is. Uh, for for t- right. Titus two eleven. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness. And worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself from us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. That that doesn't necessarily just mean go to heaven. Okay, he says that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And then even Paul tells Titus in verse 15, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee, meaning, meaning 
uh, Paul's telling Timothy, you better preach on this and drop the hammer on this subject and don't let anybody even scare you away from this because this is absolute Bible truth. And Absolutely. that's the problem with this modern Christianity. It doesn't line up with this. It's, it, it's a, it's, I don't know. I don't know what you call it. Do you call it just a false grace or a lascivious? What do you, what do you call this stuff? I, I believe it's exactly what Jude said. They turn a grace of God into lasciviousness. And really, hmm. the acid test for me is First John chapter 3, of course, in verse 6. It says, Whosoever buys an end sinneth not, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Mm. For his seed remaineth in him, for he cannot sin because he is born of God. Those are very strong verses. Mm. Um, wow. Very strong ber- verses that somebody that is born of God does not commit. Of course, we know commit, practice, habitually practice sin. It, it just won't happen because the Bible says that his seed remaineth in himself. Um, there'll be Holy Spirit conviction. There'll be chastisement. There'll be changing going on in this. And, and, it, and it really back, went back to what I talked to her about. I told her I'm convinced of this. I said, I'm convinced. A lot of people have never been under true conviction of the Holy Ghost of God because mm. they've never been under the sound preaching of the Word of God, Romans chapter 10. And I told her that, and it was very foreign to her, but this verse right here, like you just read, um, um, these, this type of Christianity today that says it's okay to live in sin and, and okay to okay to do these things God understands, you know, they're doing exactly Romans chapter 6 is what they're doing. Mm. And he said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the Apostle Paul says, God forbid. Wow. God forbid. Those are strong verses. Strong yeah. verses. Well, and, uh, you know, and I want to let our audience know First John 3, 8, he that committeth sin, that E-T-H on the end of that word, that's an infinitive, and the translators of the Bible put that there because that is a continual, perpetual sin. Like, you know, like I know Christian people who, like, they cussed a lot before they got saved, and even now, like, you know, they, they, they still, if they if they hit their toe on a piece of furniture, they might let something out, you know what I mean? <laughs> so they well, may struggle yeah, or something I, like that. But this is talking yeah. about, like, if you're like a crackhead and you get saved and 10 years later you're still a crackhead if and, and even worse now, then you you never did get saved because God changes lives. I agree. I agree 100. percent I mean, you go to the Apostle Paul and see his life, and I've heard people say, "Well, God doesn't say, do that to everybody." Well, I mean, salvation that saved him and changed him from Saul to Paul and changed him from killing is the same Holy Ghost of God that got a hold of me, that got a hold of you, that gets hold of every believer. I'm convinced of that. Mm. It's the same salvation, the same change. Um, uh, we're renewed in the image of Him after. It, him that created him, um, the gospel said as well. So uh, I, I'm with you, brother. I, I just uh, it concerns me today. And you know, you look at men like A.W. Toes or Leonard Ravenhill, and man, I can mention so many other men of God that stood for holiness and separation and and, and true. Uh, to, and they perfected holiness in the fear of God, as the Word of God says. And people, they just have no interest in that, and that bothers me. And that doesn't line up mm. with New Testament Christianity. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there even that don't go to church and they claim that they know the Lord and they never, never have been a member of a church for years and years and years. And I've, I've always said, you know, if, if your faith can't get you to church, what makes you think it's going to get you to heaven? And, uh, brother, <laughs> absolutely. I agree with you. Um, and I got a quote here and I, I think, I think you would like to hear this and maybe the audiences would as well. And, mm. and it really stuck out to me because, um, I think this paint has painted a picture of the modern, if you want to say church, to the very T and has really exposed it uh, for, for what it's trying to be and turning into, of course, with the apostasy that's going on in today. And it says, the early church wanted to know, what must I do to be saved? Today's church is asking, what can I do and still be saved? Oh, wow. Say that again. The early church wanted to know, what must I do to be saved? Today's church is asking, what can I do and still be saved? <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> That's very profound. That's profound. That, uh, it really is, uh, I, brother. And, I, and I'm nothing. I'm just a sinner saved by the grace of God. If I got what I deserve, and I do deserve it, I'd be in hell right now. But by God's grace, he saved me. And I, I can't thank him enough for it. But, you know, the same grace that saves is the same grace that you, that you showed teaches us 
to not denying godliness and worldly lust. So, yeah. Um, the the thing on my mind the day I come under conviction was not, you know, what can I still do and have Christ? Uh, no, what was on my heart was I have to have Christ now. Everything else, I don't care. I don't mm. want it. It's behind me. I see Christ in the cross, and I must have Him. Mm. And that's what. And, and I believe. Man, so many people are void of that, and I and it's a, and it's a it's a product of, uh, you know, the the type of elevation worship type churches and stuff, and it's sad. Well, you know, and and I have people that get onto me, brother Austin, and say, "Why don't you just preach the gospel and leave all that alone?" Well, the problem is there there are strong gospel implications to this type of theology. I think this theology is really is is an assault on the gospel. It demeans and attacks the gospel. And I uh, heard a man's preaching on marriage not too long ago, and he says that uh, to say yes to a woman is to say no to all the other women in the world, in speaking of marriage. And, uh, and if we're going to accept Christ, we have to say no to the world and to, and to, and to our desires. And, uh, and so, I agree. you know, we have to receive Christ as Lord and Savior and, uh, you know, not just, just pray a little prayer or repeat a little prayer. I mean, that's, Amen. you know, Amen. we got to, we, there's something got to have, we got to make a choice and, and, and make, you know, Jesus has got to be more than just our boyfriends. You know what I mean? Like that, that I heard a song years ago, dumb song said, Jesus is my boyfriend. I agree. I agree. You know? Well, you know, it takes me back to the and I can church. And he said, Hey, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. This, oh, yes. this, this, that's simple. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, of course, Second Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 10, you know, uh, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And um, I'm convinced so many people get so much worldly sorrow, they're, they're sad at their situation in life, their finances. Like one thing that lady mentioned to me that stuck out to me about worldly sorrow was she's like, God made me not homeless no more. But to me, she was sorrowful that she was homeless. She wasn't sorrowful. She was a sinner before God. Mm. And there's a big difference in that, you know, and I mm. believe a lot of people get so sorrowful about their um, physical um, uh, or lack of necessity, and, and they get so sad that their kids are taken away from them. They've been on dope, and they've been on drink, and, and you know, they get so uh, upset about their life situation that they say, well, I can turn to Jesus as, a, as an escape goat, you know, as my as my escape door, and, and he can have me have a purpose-driven life or a, a better life, and Mm. And, you know, that's not the gospel. That is not the gospel. Sure, sure. Well, it's kind of like uh, John MacArthur's famous quote. He said, if you're living your best life now, you're probably going to hell. And, uh, and I agree. <laughs> and I agree with that, brother. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. So It's true. It's true. So, I mean, well, it's just, you know, and, and this is the fruit that we're seeing because of that. You know, people look at preachers that preach the whole counsel of God and that, you, you know, you're, you're just an outcast. You know, you're a bigot. You're mean. You're not, you're hateful. You don't love me. You don't care about me when in reality it's the other way around. Yeah. Well, First Thessalonians 1, 9 is the verse you just said a minute ago. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And I'm probably going to put this on a T-shirt. To God from idols to serve. And uh, that is New Testament salvation to God from idols to serve, and that service and that from idols that's that that's the fruit of salvation. But the problem is today we got people that want to turn to God, but keep their idols and not serve. Amen. That's right, and that's just not that's just not biblical salvation. That's not biblical Christianity. And you know, even our church theme this year was being a biblical Christian. You know, looking at Acts chapter seventeen, verse eleven. You know how the Bereans they were more noble than those of like that. They searched the scriptures daily. They they received the word with all readiness of mind, or searched the scriptures daily where those things are. So it seems to me most people today they could care less about searching this book. They want to go find out what this guru thinks or that guru thinks. When in reality, they need to be searching that book. Right, right, and uh, you know, and that's the thing is that uh, you know if you try to take. Jesus out of Christianity, a lot of people would say, well, you don't have Christianity. But the problem is a lot of these New Testament churches or so-called rock and roll churches is what I like to call them. Uh, they take rock. the Bible out of Christianity. Yes, they do. And and if you take the Bible out of Christianity, you don't have Christianity anymore. You have a, a New Age religion. And it seems to me, from all the evidence I can get, these people are practicing New Age mysticism and using the vocabulary of Christianity. Is that kind of some of the stuff you're seeing? 
Yes, brother, absolutely. I agree with you. You know, a lot of people, they sound very religious. They take religious terminology and they sound good. And, and on the surface at all, it all, you know, the, the, the ears, you know, they're like, man, okay, this person sounds Christian. It, this looks Christian. But when you get into it and you actually deep get, get into the depth of it and research it and search out what's going on, a lot of it is just like you said, the mysticism and the euphoria and the feelings and the emotions and just the new age hmm. uh, aspect to it with a lot of paganism involved. And, and brother, it's just not good. It's kind of, it's like what Constantine did when he became so-called religious and wanted the pageantry from Rome. And now we have the Catholic Church. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. Well, First John yeah. 4, 1, beloved, believe not every spirit. Now, I, you know, you could even throw in there, believe not every preacher. But try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And so how do you try the spirits? You have to, you have to know the Word of God and see if they measure Absolutely. up. Absolutely. And, you know, that, and the Word of God talks so much about discernment, um, which a lot of people do not have, um, sadly. And I, that takes getting from God. You know, James 1, 5, I mean, you lack wisdom, let a master of God give it to all men liberally, and the praise not shall be given him. And I just don't think people are searching the Word of God, you know, Psalm 119 is the great, the great chapter in the Word of God on the Word of God. In verse 133, he says, order my steps in thy word. Mm. If people go and their steps will be ordered in the word, they would ha- there would be no confusion. Um, and I'm convinced of that. And also, um, like you just said, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. I, I, I'm especially weary of these spirits that look good, talk good, um, are shining the light as bright as they possibly can. Because I know Paul said Second Corinthians eleven thirteen for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, since forming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers mm. also be transformed into the minister as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So, mm. um, and that's uh, what was that? Second Corinthians eleven. 11, uh, 13 through 15. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, Satan has preachers, his ministers. That's exactly right. Wow. And that, and that he, his, his ministers, ain't that something his men And you you tell that the, the modern Christianity today, that Satan has his preachers and Satan has his own children. They look at you like you have three heads when it's just, it's right there in the New Testament. I mean, I didn't come up with this stuff, all, you know, and just <laughs> think mm. about it one day. And, and, and it just, but it's just, He's got his ministers, and they and they look real good. And um, unfortunately, like it says, their end's going to be according to their works, and mm. it's just sad. Right, right. Well, you know, I guess my question is, okay, there's a lot of people out there that are into this. This stuff is massively popular. It is very influential. Uh, what is the road, in your opinion, how to get people out of this? What do you think? Uh, just my opinion personally is what I try to go back to with our church. I try to ground, ground. Well, first of all, of course, to be preaching the gospel, man, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Ghost, seeing people truly get converted. I mean, I know, and you've heard, uh, you know, Brother Sammy Allen has said it. I've heard other people say it. Um, R.G. Lee, um, uh, R.A. Torrey, all these people said most people they ever saw saved was church members, people that were religious but lost. And mm. I believe that's key, number one, seeing people truly get born again by the grace of God. Number two is, um, uh, preachers and churches and ministries getting back to solely focused on teaching and studying and rightly dividing the Word of God and getting Christians truly grounded in that Bible so they won't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I believe that's a big, big way um, that, that people will get out of this is getting, as my pastor told me, in the book, in the book, in the book. Very simple, but very profound and very effective. And I, I believe that's what it all gets back to. And until people get back to that Bible, back to Holy Ghost filled prayer, back to, um, uh, uh, just the, the, the truth of the work and the word of God, I believe that people will continue to be led astray. Mm. Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. Well, you know, and that's the thing. I think, and it just appears to me just after watching it for a while, uh, that the Lord allows these churches to operate so that at, at maybe even as judgment against those who have rejected the gospel. And um, and that's just that maybe that's just my opinion, but it seems like that's that's the case that uh, that the Lord, you know, kind of like in Second Thessalonians chapter two, these people rejected the gospel so much that God God Himself sent strong delusion to them, and He's going to do that in the tribulation period. And I think the Antichrist right. is going to have signs and wonders. He's going to have 
an unbelievably powerful deception, and the whole world's going to fall under it. But but I, it, it seems like maybe these people rejected the gospel so much that God said, okay, fine, I'll, you, can have a, you can have your own church then and, and do it however you want, but without me. And it seems like that's what, the, this is just a work of the flesh. These people have no holiness. These people, I mean, they, they, it's okay to be a, dr- a Christian alcoholic, a, you know, a Christian homosexual, a Christian fornicator, a Christian everything. And, and it's terrible, the, the road of apostasy that we've gone down. And I think these, these churches have lost their way. And I think even the good churches, they're, they're so appalled with it. They don't even know where to start to deal with it. But I think we've got to get back to the book. And what was that phrase? Get in the book, get in the book, get in the book. I like that. That's right. That's right. And I think it goes back to that quote earlier as well. And, you know, the early church said, what must I do to be saved? People today, you know, they're saying, what can I do and still be saved? And, and a lot of it goes back to these churches, they're suffering that woman Jezebel to teach, you know, as the revelation said, and, and, you know, I mean, to mm. you apply these, I guess you could apply it to men as well. You know, they're letting these men and women teach who are just totally wrecking the Word of God and totally just, I mean, it's out of context, um, um, just doing yeah. whatever, you, they, you know, they want to do with it and handling it, the Word of God deceitfully. And, and Paul said, of course, we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. And um, I think a lot of people they corrupt more the, the word of God, but yes, um, that I just had that thought though about about the woman Jezebel teaching. We've got a lot of them teaching today when they shouldn't be shouldn't be teaching. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, uh, man, that's just crazy. And and I just you know seems like the early church they were worried about purity, and that's really one of the reasons why the uh, the first amendment was given is so that we don't have to all congeal into the same church and uh, we can we can have our we can we can separate and create our own pure church and that's what the that's what a lot of these people wanted early early on because they didn't want to be in a church filled with a bunch of baptized infants that never had been converted and there's a lot of history there and uh, and so it's it's a big deal and so i i think the the purity of the church has been absolutely just just set to the side, almost forgotten about, to the point where it's the unity of the church and even the size of a church is being emphasized today. And we've adopted a pragmatic mindset into where it's just whatever gets people in the door is what's right and uh, doesn't care how unbiblical or how how worldly it makes the people. As long as there's people here, period, it's right. And I think that's a dangerous thing that's happening, and I think a lot of these false prophets have uh, have fed this to people, who, and they've taken a hook, line, and sinker, and uh, and have literally destroyed their own souls as a result of that. I agree with you. I mean, and, you know, First Thessalonians four seven says, "For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness." I mean, God's called the Christian to be holy. I mean, He's called him to be um, impure and unclean, and 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 it's sad today because. Uh, that's the last thought on so many people's mind. And like, as you went back to most people's desires, just to get them in, get them in, get them in mm. and keep, keep them in. whatever we got to do to keep them here. And, and it's just, it, it's sad. It, it really is. God hath not you. called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Well, how do you define holiness? And see, and holiness, and, and to me, uh, in my study of the Word of God, holiness, I mean, God said, be holy for I'm holy. Uh, holiness is, is who God is, so I think we should study who God is and His attributes and take on those same. And I think the hmm. Holy Ghost will help a Christian perfect holiness in the will, of, in the in, in the in God, and in, in the fear of God. And I believe the Holy Ghost, I mean, the Bible says He'll conform us to the image of the Son. Hmm. And, um, so, and, you know, I believe. That's the importance of it. Well, do you think maybe holiness, maybe a, a good definition, I'm just throwing this out there, uh, holiness is the character of God. Absolutely, yes. And that's why I was saying, let's find out who God is, what his attributes are, and just do what he does and be try to be who he is. And, of course, we can't beat God. And, of course, no little God's doctrine, hmm. as even Furtick would, would even teach, even— um, if he's doing it knowingly or knowingly, I don't know, but he's doing it. But we're not God, and we can't be God. But I believe I've got the Holy Spirit of God living in me, of course, Romans chapter 8, and he will conform me to be more like God as I progressively get sanctified as I go on in this life, of course. Sure, sure. Wow. Well, that's a lot to think about right there. And uh, 
But, you know, there's a lot of people out there looking for churches and uh, trying their best to get into some place that preaches the book. Uh, can you maybe help us out here real quick and, and as we close up here um, and uh, tell us, you know, what kind of what kind of church should these people look for? I mean, what are some of the things they should look for in a church and a pastor? What, what, what would be your guidelines you kind of throw out there for folks? Uh, my, my, my counsel or guideline on this would be find a church that preaches the Word of God. Find a pastor a church uh, with a pastor who believes that book over opinion, over tradition, over anything, over uh, the liberal movement of today, over the charismatic movement of today, has has no preconceived notions but believes that book as it is written. Mm. They believe and preach the Word of God as it's written. I find a church like that for sure, number one. That that would be the main thing I would do because it all goes back, to me it all goes back to that. It goes back to a lack of the Word of God being taught and preached and prayed over and given in the power of the Holy Spirit. So my uh, encouragement to people that would listen to this is to please prayerfully seek out a church that believes that Bible, that believes the King James Bible is the Word of God, that believes God has inspired and preserved His Word and believes it over every fiber of their being and will teach and preach the whole counsel of that book. Mm. Amen. Amen. Well, and uh, folks, you can use our website, independentbaptist.church, to find a church just like this one. And uh, this is a good pastor, Brother Austin, here with us. And he is the pastor of Lighthouse Baptist Church in Bolivia, North Carolina. And I preached for them not too long ago. Good, sweet people, wonderful folks. And uh, you can find a church just like this one in your neck of the woods using independentbaptist.church. And uh, and that is a great thing. So, um I appreciate that so very much. So, uh, hey, uh, Pastor, have you um, have you been to our spread shop uh, store yet? Uh, yes, I have. I actually have um, one of y'all shirts, which I was wearing when you picked me up, yeah. listening to Stephen Furtick, <laughs> Dr. Matters. Love that shirt. I love it. <laughs> Wear it all the time. He, he wore a Dr. Matters shirt to play an elevation for when I got in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, Brother Spencer, uh, me and him went to the battleship, and actually a man commented on the shirt and how much he liked it when we was both walking down the ramp of that battleship. Yeah, amen, amen. Yeah, it gets a lot of attention. I, I was in a Cracker Barrel wearing mine a while back and someone came to me and says hey you a calvinist i said what <laughs> and he goes oh you calvinist talk about doctrine i said i'm not a calvinist he goes well what in the world are you and i said i'm a baptist preacher he goes what's that <laughs> and i'm like oh, oh lord have mercy he goes and he did like he was mad at me in cracker barrel he said you just think what you believe is right and everybody else is wrong i said well no sir i, I just believe the bible is right and he goes oh <laughs> well I agree with you on that. And then he was nice to me. <laughs> and people, people have so many pre- preconceived ideas about so many things. Yeah. That's what people just, man, it's, that's funny. That's a good one. Yeah. People be tripping. So yeah, that's exactly right, man. <laughs> that's exactly right. Oh man. Well, praise the Lord. Well, uh, preacher, we wanted to, uh, if we'd like to get you something from our spread shop store and, uh, just as a thank you for you coming on. And, uh, for those of the folks that are out there, you can visit our spread shop store at a link in the, uh, video here. We should have a, a, a tray, uh, like a display table where it shows some of our stuff and preacher, you let me know what you want. We'll get that for you. Uh, just as a thank you for coming on and you guys go to our spread shop store and the link in the bio and a link in the description of this video on all of our videos really and you can go check that out as well and so preacher thank you so much for coming on being with us today uh, we appreciate you do you have any words of wisdom for the crowd before we go yeah brother first thing i want to tell you is thank you for having me on and uh, hopefully this will be a blessing to some folks and um, maybe somebody confused about something in the word of god i have um, something that we said on there but i do want to thank you for inviting me on and having me on and um, I give you some words of wisdom that my pastor gave me. Stay in the book, in the book, in the book, as we've already said. That's my words of wisdom to you. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Praise God. Well, thank you so much, Preacher. And, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we're going to be bringing a lot more of quality content like this one and uh, to you guys very soon. So thank you, Preacher, and uh, you guys out there watching. God bless you, and we'll talk to you again very soon.